right. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And let me see if I can share my screen here. Okay, you should be looking at uh, physics activities for the life sciences. Can everyone see that? Okay. All right. Um, need to pull mine here. Okay. Yeah, so um, I am one of uh, several folks who have uh, developed these materials uh, that I'm about to share with you. And so uh, I would definitely like to acknowledge, uh, especially Lori McNeil, who's the, the PI of our NSF grant that uh, really um, pushed us forward in getting these materials developed and uh, uh, disseminated as much as we can. Um, like to Colin Wallace, um, David Smith, Alice Trukian, Dan Young, uh, all faculty at UNC Chapel Hill have uh, contributed greatly to these as well. Um, so I'm just one of uh, many folks who have uh, had their fingers in the development of these materials and the implementation. So um, I'd like to, first of all, before we get into the, the activities themselves, give you some background for the context in which these were developed and how we use them in the classroom. And so if you can uh, indulge me for that here. Um, so this uh, development effort started uh, around 2014, 2015, and we realized that uh, we, we needed to do something a little bit different. Um, at UNC Chapel Hill, we're uh, an R1 uh, research primary institution with about 30 faculty members, about 100 graduate students. Um, we're not the engineering school. That's the school that I came from, uh, NC State down the road. Um, so the, the introductory physics sequence for the life science majors is our largest service course. Uh, we utilize about, uh, or sorry, we have about uh, 40 uh, physics majors per year compared with about 400, or I think it's more like 600 now in biology. So, you know, we're, we're small um, as is true in many physics departments compared with biology and chemistry. Um, but it's a lot of these biology students that need to take a physics course that we are serving. And so that's uh, part of the pipeline. Uh, so we end up having about 700 or so um, students go through this IPLS sequence that uh, these activities were developed for. Uh, it's a two semester sequence um, called Physics 114 and 115. So you may hear me talk about that. Um, in our traditional format, before uh, we went uh, to this development effort, we had uh, three lectures per week, typically Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then one lab uh, that was paired with the course that met for two hours, one time per week. And there was some interactivity in the lecture, but not a lot. Um, depending on the instructor, they might use clicker questions, um, but uh, often it was traditional lecture and then uh, kind of traditional lab format. Uh, so again, here's the development team. Um, and some of these folks are uh, no longer at UNC. So David Smith is now back at the University of Washington where he did his uh, postdoc work. Uh, David Gwen has uh, moved on. Uh, Colin is still with us. Um, Alice Trukian is now at the University of South Carolina and uh, Jean Desai has retired, um, but I actually just saw her this past week. So she's still alive and well. Um, so she definitely helped us with uh, making sure that we had good relevant um, biologically uh, focused materials that uh, made sense from her perspective. Um, she has years and years of uh, experience teaching biology courses for the students who take art courses. So like many other places um, that have uh, tried to think about how they could do the IPLS course differently, uh, we looked at the, some of the national reports that were looking at changes in the requirements for uh, pre-med students, uh, biology students at large, and we wanted to, to learn from what others were doing. Um, so we didn't want to reinvent things, um, but we wanted to to learn from the best and incorporate uh, those to make the, the course as meaningful as we possibly could for the students who are taking these courses. 
because we realized these students aren't there because they want to be there. They're there because they have to take these courses. And so what did the, uh, the students hope to get out of the courses? What did the instructors uh, who were requiring them to take uh, the courses from the biology department, what did they want? Um, and we wanted to know how we could make those changes uh, sustainable uh, long-term. So here's some of those reports that we looked at as giving us some direction in terms of our development. Uh, Bio 2010, Vision and Change, and Scientific Foundations for Future Physicians. And as we were talking with the biologists, we realized that uh, quantitative skills are really important for not just physics, but more and more in the uh, biology realm as well. And so how could we utilize the, the quantitative analysis skills that we teach in our physics courses to best uh, prepare students for careers um, in the life sciences. So again, we wanted to learn from what other people were doing. Uh, the folks at the University of Maryland have been doing some great work, um, as well as uh, folks at New Hampshire. Uh, so Joe Reddish and his group, Don Meredith, uh, Jessica Volker, uh, Catherine Crouch at uh, Swarthmore College, uh, Ken Heller and uh, the PER group at the University of Minnesota. And so we, we were aware of the materials and the uh, development efforts at these schools, and we wanted to, to build upon and, and sometimes uh, ask and uh, borrow and uh, adapt materials that uh, they had already created. So again, we wanted to figure out how could we best meet the, the needs of the students. Um, so we had lots of discussions with uh, folks, especially from biology, but also chemistry and uh, our own department to figure out what should be the goals. And we wanted to focus on um, the, the skills and uh, um, kind of the, the lesson, the broader learning objectives rather than just certain topics. But uh, we, we did ask for, you know, were there any certain topics that should or should not be included as well? Um, we definitely uh, learned that uh, an emphasis on uh, being good thinkers, logical critical thinking skills was important. And so we decided on a, a lecture studio format that I'll describe here uh, momentarily. And again, wanted to adapt resources that were already being developed, but then design some of our own. We wanted to figure out how we could make these changes that we were planning on uh, creating and implementing sustainable over a long time. And so we wanted to make sure that these courses were basically instructor resistant. Um, the courses would be owned by the department and we didn't want uh, instructors coming in and throwing out what we had done and uh, coming up with something completely different. So we wanted them to be um, maybe adapted over the years, but not thrown out and uh, revised significantly from semester to semester. So we wanted to prepare materials that could be used um, with the very little effort so that an instructor could basically walk in and teach um, without having to, to do a lot of additional preparation or modification. But if they wanted to make some modifications, especially for the lecture, they could do that because the, the lecture was designed to prepare students for the studio activities uh, that we're gonna look at today. So again, uh, instructors then could focus on the method for how they would uh, deliver this preparation in the, the lecture time rather than creating new materials. And we decided that uh, we'd have a team teaching um, model where these courses would be taught by two or three faculty members um, and they would be sharing the responsibility, rotating through um, maybe one uh, instructor would teach one week and then another instructor would teach the next week. And so we needed also a, a mentor and apprentice model so that uh, the experienced instructors could pass along their knowledge and expertise to new instructors. So we came up with this uh, rotator model for the faculty members. Um, we needed a person who would serve as the studio coordinator that would be um, probably the same person who would uh, be the course coordinator for multiple semesters and make sure that the, the whole operation was running smoothly and then bring in new people as novice instructors maybe not necessarily younger instructors. Sometimes the novice instructors, like uh, this semester, I have uh, one brand new faculty member uh, that I'm mentoring 
and uh, the oldest faculty member in our department are both new to the, the course. So there's an example of uh, older new both being novices. And then we needed an infrastructure for how um, we can make this all happen, ideally with no additional expense. And we decided, it's a pretty big lift, but we decided to do this transformation for all of the, all the sections, both courses in the sequence. And uh, it turns out that we ended up using this lecture studio model for the sequence for the physical science uh, courses as well. Uh, so all four of our introductory physics courses ended up utilizing this lecture studio model, uh, but these PALS activities were specifically for the life science course sequence. And then of course we needed uh, TA training to make sure that the uh, graduate and undergraduate students who serve as uh, teaching assistants were well prepared uh, to, to teach. Uh, they primarily teach in the, the studios. So we decided to not try to adapt what we had done before, but basically blow up uh, the, the course and start all over blank slate and thinking about this fresh, um, again, using those resources and uh, having half a million dollars to, to help with the process did not hurt um, and definitely pushed us to, to do this implementation that we were planning to do anyhow, but to, to do it um, more quickly and more effectively. Uh, so we decided and learned that uh, we would need to adapt uh, some of the topics that we had taught before were not going to be included in this new curriculum and some new topics that uh, had not been taught would be included. And so I'll talk about those here momentarily. Um, and we wanted to think about really what are the foundational topics that students need in order to build their understanding of not just physics, but also biology. And we really want to have a focus on conceptual understanding um, and quantitative reasoning uh, rather than on lab techniques or lab report writing. So the new format, students do not write full lab reports. They uh, collaborate on uh, answering questions as a group in the studio. And so they write um, sometimes uh, short sentences uh, or short uh, several sentences sometimes. Um, or answers to, to questions um, with diagrams or graphs. So bits and pieces that you might find in a lab report, but no formal lab reports. And in the previous version of the course, we did have some lab practicums that uh, we still retain for the physical science majors, but not for the life science sequence. So students are getting exposed to some laboratory procedures, but they're not being assessed um, on those techniques and error analysis um, as we had in the past. I'm a little bit sad about that because I wrote my dissertation on students' understanding about uh, error analysis. Um, we still retain that for the physics uh, majors that uh, need it more. So here's some topics that uh, were added and eliminated. Um, and we never included much on planetary motion, but sometimes uh, depending on who is teaching, it might be included. Uh, we did have rotational kinematics in the previous versions and a little bit on AC circuits, but those are not included at all in the the new curriculum. And then we've got some new topics um, that uh, are part of our instruction that I never learned as a student. And so I had, a, I had to learn while teaching. Um, turns out that uh, scaling is really important for different biological systems. Um, the proportion, for example, for humans um, are not the same for babies as they are for adults. Babies have relatively larger heads uh, compared with the rest of their body than adults do. Um, just as an example. So that's called allometric scaling as opposed to isometric scaling. And stress and strain, uh, tendons and uh, um, muscle fibers uh, don't behave like linear hookian springs. Uh, they're not metal. And it turns out that uh, that nonlinearity is important for biological systems. And diffusion uh, governs a lot of the uh, different biological processes. So we've incorporated these topics into the curriculum. And uh, that's a bit of a challenge for the instructors because they're learning as they're going, but we keep it such that um, it still is accessible to the, the students, the instructors, without knowing a lot of biology. So they're learning some biology along the way, um, but not so much that it becomes overwhelming. And then uh, revised uh, some of these other topics here in the middle. 
So here's another way of uh, showing the same information. Uh, I can see with this Venn diagram, which topics were added, eliminated, um, and uh, included in both. And this is for the first semester uh, course and then the second semester course. And you may notice that uh, in the second semester course, we actually start the sequence with fluids. And that becomes a nice way to lead into uh, DC circuits because flow in equals flow out applies to both fluids and uh, electrical current. Um, has different names, uh, continuity equation versus uh, uh, to cross junction rule, but it's the same idea. And so that turns out to be a, a nice introduction. So in some curricula, um, you might see fluids in uh, the first semester course, but we decided to put it in the second semester course. Uh, so again, we wanted to rely on what other people had done and what the research showed was most effective. And so we really wanted to incorporate as many um, relevant research-based uh, teaching methods in our course and still retain the, the constraints that uh, were needed within our department um, while not breaking the budget in terms of uh, needing additional resources. And we wanted to, again, make this uh, kind of instructor proof uh, so that uh, any physics faculty member would be able to teach it without having to know and study a lot of extra biology and the uh, um, at the beginning, um, the model that we came up with for this lecture studio was based on uh, research work that uh, Alice uh, Trukian had done at uh, Kansas State University and also the Colorado School of Mines. Um, there was called New Studio. We just simply call it Lecture Studio. So in, uh, before the studio, students meet in lecture to prepare them for the studio and they do a warm up to prepare them for the lecture. And then all that prepares them for the homework and then the exams. So students attend one of, uh, usually we have two lecture sections um, that uh, usually have uh, several hundred students in them. And those students then are mixed and broken up into smaller sections in the studios of anywhere from 50 to 70 students uh, with two or three instructors in each of the studio sections. So here's that format, uh, the format for the course. Uh, students read the textbook, ideally. Um, they do a, a warm up to kind of test their understanding of that reading material. They go to lecture to then prepare them for the studio and then apply what they've learned in the lecture in the studio to the homework and then take an exam on that. And eventually, um, usually three midterm exams and a final. So this combination, warm up, lecture, studio, and homework is what we call a module. So in the PALS uh, Sakai site that uh, most of you now have access to, you'll find these different modules that have materials both for the lecture and the studio. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a way to include the, the warm up or the homework problems. Um, if you're really interested, uh, we could probably add you to one of our um, homework sites. Uh, we were using Mastering Physics, now we're using Expert TA. And so you could get access there if you uh, would like. Do this lecture studio uh, combination two times per week. So two modules per week. And so that turns out to be uh, usually 27 modules per semester. And this is designed for a semester sequence, not a quarter system. And then uh, occasionally we'll have a video or a guest lecture from a, a biologist to reinforce why we're studying this uh, information. So here's what a weekly schedule looks like. Um, those lectures are typically on Monday and Wednesday mornings to prepare students for a studio later that same day or the next day, depending on how many studio sections we need to have. So that repeats uh, Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday, Thursday. Then on Fridays, uh, we have a review session, an optional question and answer session in the morning during that lecture time or uh, a midterm exam. So. Students are not required to attend the Q&A sessions, uh, so that uh, gives them a little bit of flexibility. Those who need some extra practice uh, working on problem solving can come to those Q&A sessions, um, but then the exams, I guess, are, are required. 
Although I suppose the students wouldn't have to go if they didn't care about it, but most of them do. So each of these lectures are 50 minutes. Uh, studio is 110 minutes, normally two hours. Uh, these studios have a combination, as you'll soon see, of uh, hands-on activities, some experimentation, but that uh, that laboratory portion usually does not take the full time. So it's usually maybe a third of the time on average. Um, mostly the, the studios have a series of questions that lead students from novice to more expert-like thinking. So uh, basically tutorials, uh, similar to those uh, developed at the University of Washington and University of Maryland. Uh, sometimes there are simulations, uh, usually on FET. Um, and then uh, group problem solving are mixed in throughout. We try to have uh, one studio instructor for every 20 to 30, 25 to 30 students, I should say. So you notice in this room here, um, you've got, uh, I think this is a 50 seat, 54 seat uh, classroom and uh, have two instructors. Uh, so that's me way back there in the back and uh, that's Alice over there uh, walking around the rooms. So these rooms are scale up style classrooms, uh, typically round tables with uh, nine seats per table. So three groups of three. So the students are working in groups, uh, typically of three or four students in a group. Um, and then uh, students can collaborate within the group and uh, with other students at their table uh, if they get stuck or they raise their hand and uh, an instructor comes over and assists. So as I explained, uh, the lecture and the studio are tightly uh, connected to each other. Uh, same content is introduced in the, the lecture and then students dive deeper into that content in the studio. So this eliminates the incoherence that often happens when uh, lecture and lab um, are separated by a week or two weeks, and sometimes the material is coming first in lectures, sometimes in lab, and provides confusion and uh, uh, dissonance for students. Um, if there are multiple lecture sections, it's usually the same instructor who gives the same lecture back to back. So students are getting pretty much the same um, experience and overview, uh, regardless of which lecture section they're in. And then they're all going through the same studios too. So uh, there's very little variation in the, the nature of the um, experience for regardless of the, the studio section that they're in. And then uh, all students are doing the same homework, taking the same exams and grading is the same for all the students. Laptop is about to die here, I need to plug that in. And now we get to the part that uh, you're here for. Uh, so these uh, physics activities for the for life sciences, PALS, um, since each semester has uh, approximately 20, or I guess exactly 27 um, studio um, activities, uh, modules, um, on a particular semester, we may have a review session or may eliminate a couple of these if there's a snow day or a North Carolina, sometimes it's a hurricane day. Um, so students may not get to actually utilize all 27 in a semester, but there are a total of 54 of these uh, activities. Again, they're designed for 110 minutes each, but you could divide these into bits and pieces and use parts of them for uh, whatever class you're teaching. These are a mixture of uh, hands-on activities, again, sim uh, simulations thrown in, some pencil and paper activities, um, and group problem solving. So I'd like to think about these studios as being kind of a combination of lab and recitation type activities. Um, again, the lectures prepare the students for the studios, and then that prepares them for the, the homework and the exams. Um, in order to get uh, the instructors prepared, we do have weekly faculty meetings to talk about the, the next upcoming exam and what should be included and uh, reviewing the exam questions to make sure that they are good quality and uh, free of uh, confusing wording. Um, and we sometimes talk about the course procedures in those faculty meetings. And then usually on Fridays, we meet with um, all of the studio instructors. So that may be um, the TAs plus uh, the faculty associated with the course and in order to prepare for that next studio 
So we work through four hours of studios to two hour sessions in about an hour and a half typically. And so that's basically what we're gonna to do today uh, with you all is we're going to, to work through some of these studio activities. Um, but it's a three hour session. We're gonna hopefully get through at least three different studios. So we're not gonna keep you here for six hours, um, but because you know more physics than a typical student, uh, we can go through these quicker than uh, the students would. Um, so they usually go much slower in uh, trying to sort things out and ask questions along the way. I still encourage you to ask questions, but not uh, quite as slowly as the students might. So we'll be looking at some of these activities here soon, uh, but uh, this gives you a sense of kind of the format of what these look like. Um, again, uh, some topics that uh, um, are biologically relevant, uh, absorption, fluorescence, uh, grasshoppers, and uh, Reynolds number. Uh, Reynolds number is something that I did not get uh, much instruction on in my physics training. So here are some uh, other examples of those uh, topics. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, the impulse and momentum studio using data from a uh, faculty member in exercise and sports science at UNC, who now happens to be our chancellor, uh, Kevin Gusowitz. Uh, so this is real authentic uh, data from accelerometers that were put in the helmets of uh, the UNC football players during practice and games. And uh, kind of scary what these football players are subjected to in terms of acceleration. So you'll see that here very soon. Uh, I've got some other topics here, um, studying about ATP, I mentioned about tendons and uh, resilience. Here's a little graph here that shows the linear and the nonlinear region for uh, a biological material. Uh, some other topics for the second semester course, uh, again, fluids, uh, both statics and dynamics, and uh, electrical circuits. Again, we don't get into AC circuits, but the uh, DC circuits, we hit pretty hard. Um, getting students to understand the fundamentals so that they can understand how an EKG works or nerve signal propagation. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, a magnetism uh, studio today um, that uh, gets at uh, some of the fundamentals for how certain animals like birds and uh, sea turtles can navigate using the Earth's magnetic field. And then optics, um, giant squid has a very large eyeball, that, that's scary. And then one of my favorite studios um, is, uh, unfortunately we can't do this uh, together today because it does require lasers, but uh, uh, looking at how uh, this diffraction pattern tells us information about the, the structure of the DNA molecule being a double helix. Um, pretty fascinating uh, discovery and uh, connection. Uh, I think it might be helpful just to understand how these courses are structured, where how the, the studios uh, fit into the larger context. So these studio house activities constitute one quarter of the student's grade. Uh, so those 27 um, studio activities one quarter of their course grade, about half of their grade is made up of exams, and about half their grade is from formative assessments, where the grades are typically pretty high, average around 90% on these formative assessments, typical average here on the exams around 70%, and then overall average in the course around 80 to 85%. Um, so that uh, typically two thirds of the students are getting an A or B. Unfortunately, like 99% of the students are hoping for an A or B. So our courses are structured in such a way that uh, it does disappoint uh, a number of students, but we at least structure it so that everyone could get an A if they all perform at that 90% or higher level. Um, I keep hoping that someday that'll happen, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, in terms of program assessment, uh, how do we know that this is effective? Uh, we use uh, conceptual surveys, the fourth concept inventory, and the conceptual survey in electricity and magnetism for the first and the second semester course. Um, looking at exam grades, uh, student feedback, uh, faculty feedback, um, our meetings from our introductory physics oversight committee uh, that uh, we have discussions with uh, all four of our courses, and then looking at uh, drop, fail, and withdrawal rates. 
We've also looked at uh, gender and racial differences on these conceptual surveys, um, some uh, exam problem analysis, uh, and some specific uh, subject area analysis. And here's just an example of some uh, early uh, analysis that we looked at for the first concept inventory before, during our traditional time, kind of in the transition period, and then when we went to the, the lecture studio model. Um, got uh, an improvement in normalized gains by about a factor of two, from uh, an average of around 0.15 to about 0.35, a little bit better than a uh, factor of two there. But there's still a long ways to go. I mean, still, even with this uh, reformed methodology, uh, students are only learning roughly 35% of what they could be learning in uh, that one semester of time. Um, and other programs uh, sometimes see normalized gains as high as uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. So, you know, this is not perfect, um, but at least it's an improvement from what we were doing before. Here's the second semester. Again, normalized gains, not great. You know, average around 0.1, uh, then about 0.25 here on the CSEM. And here's some comments from students, uh, mostly positive comments for these first ones, but uh, not everyone likes these. Um, so we have more students uh, giving positive comments uh, with the, the new course sequence than with the old, but uh, still, we can't please everyone and we don't expect to, to be able to do so. But uh, with improved learning gains and more positive comments, we feel like it's a win and we have no intention of going back. Oh, we do find that uh, this seems to be a sustainable program now. Uh, we've got a number of faculty who have uh, taught these courses, not just the ones who helped develop them. Um, and teaching one of these courses, one of the, these lecture studio courses, is now a prerequisite for any faculty member who is planning to get tenure. So basically all new faculty members um, in our department have to teach one of these intro courses at some point. And so we're having quite a few people who are cycling through. Um, I think we've got up to a total of 25 uh, faculty members who have uh, taught these courses at uh, some point now. Um, well over 100 graduate TAs uh, and undergraduate LAs and well over 5,000 students now since we started this back in uh, 2014. And uh, the biology faculty are happy with these too. And uh, you know, here's a quote, uh, our students love this course. I don't think that all the students love the course, but uh, at least some do. So if we're making the biology faculty happy, that's a win as well. And as I mentioned earlier, um, these studios are taught in uh, scale-up rooms. Uh, we had to remodel uh, four of our uh, traditional classrooms and, uh, and including a library as uh, Joe mentioned. And so we have one uh, scale-up style room for each of the four courses that we're using this uh, lecture studio model. So the overall message here is that uh, the studio style of teaching is feasible at a large institution um, and we can do so without additional staff needed. Uh, learning gains have been improved, students uh, like it better, and we're able to, uh, to do this in a way that is sustainable. Um, got, uh, what is it now, six years, uh, seven years now, and. Uh, counting um, and uh, don't necessarily need to have members who are all in on this. Um, even those who are somewhat reluctant have been able to be successful in teaching uh, these classes. And it works actually quite well for new incoming faculty because uh, they don't have to prepare new lessons. Uh, the lessons are already there for them. They just need to uh, put their own spin on it and think about the delivery. But we have learned that TA training is very important and uh, those weekly uh, prep sessions are quite important. And the renovated classrooms um, certainly have helped us, but this could be done in traditional labs too. In fact, our very first time uh, teaching the, the studios was in a traditional lab. So if you want more information, um, if you're not already added to the PAL site, I can add you, you just need to your email address and I can add you to that site so you can get access to all of the activities. Uh, you can learn more at our physics and astronomy education research website. 
or you can send an email message. And we're working on getting these materials up on the Living Physics portal. Some materials are there, but not all of them. Um, so still working on that. And uh, the Physics 114, 115 course development, pretty much uh, what I just talked about, um, is in a, an AJP article that was published in 2018. So you can look that up too. And by the way, this uh, presentation is on the, the PAL site um, under the workshop uh, section. So if you want to go back and refer to anything that I've talked about, you can do so there. All right. So before we talk about uh, a class, let me just uh, see if there are any questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. See what questions anybody has. Rod had a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, one, where are the materials available? And how many hours a week are the students meeting now? <clears throat> Yeah, so the materials are available um, on that PAL site. And uh, Rod, I think maybe you uh, registered recently? Uh, I don't know, a week ago, maybe something? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you're not on my list. So uh, okay. um, if you put your email in the chat, I can add you. Right. The, for today's purpose, um, we're going to break up into uh, groups here using the breakout rooms. And as long as one person has access in that group, to the, the PAL site uh, that should work well for our purposes. Um, sorry, what was the other question about the hours? Yeah, how many hours? I, I mean, when you talked about it, I, I didn't quite get like how many hours a week are the students now meeting for the course? Yeah, so it's a four credit hour course. Um, so in the, the previous version, they were meeting three hours per week for the lecture and two hours per week for the lab. So nominally five hours per week give or take a few minutes there. Uh, now they're meeting six hours per week. So two hours of lecture on Monday and Wednesday morning, and then four hours in studio. So we've shifted from a majority of the time in lecture to now a majority of time in uh, interactive engagement and the, the studio. And then uh, if students want to attend that uh, Friday Q&A session, they could, but it's not required. So we thought maybe we'd get some pushback in uh, shifting from five hours per week to six hours per week, right. but we did not. Um, I mean, students say that it's uh, quite a bit of time required for both the old and the new version of the course, but it is a STEM course with a lab. So this is true for any STEM course with the lab that uh, it does require more time. But where we've got some time savings was the students don't have any homework for the studios. They're designed so that they could be done in that two hour period. Now we allow students to do work outside of class and uh, have some extra time to wrap up and meet with their students. Um, so we don't require them to submit their work at the end of studio, but if they're done, they could do it then and uh, not have any lingering lab reports um, hanging over their heads like they did before. Because at one point we were requiring one lab report per week and those take up a lot of time. So that's been cut out. See Richard, Richard has, has a, a question. Yeah, Richard. Richard. Yeah, uh, I was curious about the instructor, mm -hmm. uh, like student face to face mm -hmm. time. How, like, what was the change in the uh, instructor time commitment for meeting with students, mm -hmm. like in lecture or the studios? Yeah. So, from the kind of the workload from the faculty perspective, is that what you're thinking about? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Besides like the prep stuff, because obviously it seems like you got rid of most of having to do that other than refreshing things, but actually like a face to face time with students. So, um, so it depends on whether a faculty member is teaching uh, the lecture or the studio or both in the same semester. Um, we have, uh, because this was a, a concern for our faculty, especially the tenure track faculty who did not want to have to spend more time than they typically would be spending on a class. Um, we had to come up with some different guidelines. So we have a document that I can share with you if you're interested uh, that kind of lays out the roles and expectations for the different parts of the course, whether it's a faculty rotator or a studio instructor or the course coordinator. But we've tried to make it so that the workload is about the same as it would be teaching one of these courses as it would be for like an intermediate e and course um, if they were doing that. So we've aimed for 12 hours per week as the kind of the, the typical workload for a faculty member, um, because that seemed to be 
where the faculty were coming out in terms of their expectation in terms of a, a reasonable workload. Um, so that includes, uh, on average, two to four hours per week, contact time with students, depending on what their role is, uh, preparation time, um, meeting as part of a group to uh, talk about the, the next upcoming exam or any problem students, and then office hours. Thank you. I have a question too. You mentioned yeah. that during the warm-ups, uh, students hopefully will have read the book, uh, the textbook. Do you assign a reading before you teach the topic? Yes. Yes. So the, the class schedule has uh, the schedule for what module is being presented that day, um, what warm-up reading is, uh, or what reading is needed to do in order to answer the warm-up questions that uh, basically check to see if the students are understanding the reading material um, before the lecture. So that's due midnight before the lecture and the, the next morning. Yeah, if they do that, that should help really if they come to class prepared. Do they that's read it. before class in general? Those 67% of apps? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> yeah. um, that, I mean, it's my experience though with pre class reading. Some, some do, but uh, my experience is that I would say maybe maybe three-fourths of the class uh, does not do as, as much reading as what we expect. Um, the dedicated students do the reading, um, or at least they say they do. Um, but the, those warm-up exercises are at least there to, to help ensure that they're at least looking at the reading material, even if they're not reading everything, and at least getting their head into the, the topic a little bit before coming into lecture. So Thank I would you. say at least a little bit for everyone, um, but they don't read as much as we would like for them to. And I should mention too, that we are using um, the Knight Jones Field textbook, um, College Physics by Knight Jones and Field as uh, kind of our primary source for um, notation, uh, the readings, the um, some of the figures that we use in the lecture. Um, but we are allowing students to use the, the open source OpenStax book as uh, an alternative so that students are not required to purchase a $300 textbook. Pearson isn't real happy with us about that, but it's the way it is. And then I mentioned we, we shifted from uh, Mastering Physics to Expert TA to also save students some costs there. And then we, use, uh, we were using iClicker in class and now we're using Poll Everywhere to again, save some cost. So I've been trying to, to be very cognizant of the, the costs associated with the course. So the only requirement uh, in terms of the cost now is uh, $35 per semester for expert TA. I like it when Pearson is not happy. I'd have to say it's interesting because I've done the exact same thing lately. I've gone to expert TA and that's it pretty much. Yeah, interesting. But Pearson comes with a textbook. I don't know about Expert TA. They get the ebook with Pearson, and our students pay only $35, but I think there is some other arrangement. They get a textbook with Pearson. Any other questions uh, before we get into some of these activities? All right, um, Chris, I forgot to mention that uh, um, we will need to make sure that uh, when we break into uh, the, the breakout rooms that at least one person who has access to the, the PAL site uh, is in each of those. So we may need to shift people around if this doesn't work. Um, first up, are you ready for the breakout rooms? I believe Joe is handling our breakout room. Oh, uh, sorry, okay. I I'm gonna try. I have to pull it back up because it timed out. In just a minute here. All right. Now let me share my screen again.
Okay, so this is what the, the panel site looks like. Um, this is in uh, uh, Sakai, which is a, a learning management system. Um, we're now using Canvas. So uh, within the next year, uh, the Sakai site is going to have to be transferred over to Canvas, or we're going to have to use a different platform. But uh, this is what we have for right now. So this should uh, be able to be used for at least another year, from what I've been told. Um, we've got the overview here. And then if you click on the resources, this is where all of the good stuff is found. So under these resources, we have a sample uh, general course materials. So this uh, gives some of the, the background, um, does have a little bit of information here about the master in physics uh, homework problems, um, course syllabus and course schedule. So you can see what those look like for both the first and the second semester course. So again, physics 114 is basically Newton's laws of motion, mechanics. Uh, physics 115 is the ENM course, the second semester course. And then in the other folder, uh, the units are basically the lesson plans for each of the sections. So the courses are broken into um, topics that are grouped then. So like uh, one unit might include um, like forces in motion and uh, another unit might include uh, like torque. And we've got uh, a couple of uh, pieces on uh, on torque. Um, so these are basically the, the large headings. And then if you wanted to find say uh, momentum, so that would be up here in the kinematics and dynamics and momentum, that module is within a broader unit. So you can see that the, we've got kinematics, dynamics, and then momentum is at the end of this unit. And so if we click there, this is a folder that then has several materials in it, including the studio document. So this uh, document here, this PDF, is the, the activity that the students would see in class. But there are also some other files here that are helpful. So this is the, uh, the PowerPoint that would be used in the lecture. Uh, there's a, an Excel file here that's a template for doing some of the analysis that the students use. And uh, there's a video here, an MP4 video that gets used as part of the, the Logger Pro analysis. And so there are Logger Pro files here. So students would also see uh, some of these files in their resources. Um, some of these units also have the, the rubric. Um, so I think I pointed to the wrong one. This, this one that does not say rubric is the one that the students would use. Uh, this rubric would be the instructor's solution manual, basically. Um, we never publish the rubrics for the students to see be, be, because we reuse the same studios each semester. And so we don't want to spoil the, the learning fund. Um, we don't want students coming in with the answer key. And so the, the rubric is available to the TAs, but not to the students, as you might expect. So if we click here on this impulse and momentum, then that should pull up the document that the students would be using in the studio. Again, working in groups of three or four uh, together in a two-hour session. So this is what I'd like for you to access in your group um, and work through. Oh, I should mention too, um, these materials, these courses um, were originally developed thinking that uh, we would require a calculus. Um, that turned out to be a, not a popular decision. And students were taking these courses at other places to avoid the calculus requirement. So now we've made these calculus light. So the calculus is no longer required for these courses, but we still have some references to calculus. So look, there's an integral, but it, it can be simplified. And so we just are really thinking about the area under the curve. So we use the ideas of calculus without requiring students to actually do any differentiation or integration, especially on exams. Uh, they may find the area of a triangle a curve on an exam, but they're and they may do numerical integration. Um, we have some of that here in the studio, but uh, they're not doing calculus integration. 
So each of these studios um, are anywhere from three to six or seven pages. So a lot of words that students have to read through and each one has an applications and extensions section um, where the students are supposed to work in their group to answer these questions without the help of the instructors. <clears throat> so the, the TAs in the, the class are able to answer questions for everything up into that last section where this is kind of like a, a quiz. Um, so any kind of a variation in the grade typically comes from this last section where the students are supposed to be applying what they've learned um, earlier in the studio to these questions here at the end. And you'll notice that uh, as you work through these studios, that uh, each section starts off with some very basic questions just to get the students kind of thinking a little bit. But then usually the last question in a section is the, the most challenging question where sometimes students get stuck and need some help in getting that question answered. Dwayne, maybe before we head into breakout rooms, let's make sure that uh, people are able to get to the site. Um, if that's all right. Quick show of hands. Uh, who has been able to access the, the PAL site? The PAL site, yes, but not the, camp, not the, um, the, the studio documents. Okay. Are you Can I to... share my screen so I show you what I have, maybe? Yeah. So I'm here. And so I thought we could uh, debrief a little bit from uh, this first activity, uh, see what thoughts you had, any questions about the uh, kind of the structure, um, what it uh, brought up for you. Uh, there were a couple of places where I felt like the activity was really well scaffolded, um, where students would discuss an idea and then a couple of questions later or on the next part, uh, they would see the results of those ideas like play out in a graph or um, there, was, there was another way that I had, there was a good connection that I thought was made. So I thought that that was really well designed to uh, help students think through things and then confirm their thoughts. Yeah, and, and you'll see that in each of the, the studios that, uh, again, taking students from kind of a novice-like thinking, some easy questions leading up to some harder questions. Oftentimes, uh, a trickier question is answered in the next paragraph. And so if they're just kind of patient, um, they get some confirmation as they go through. There are sometimes uh, checkpoints. Um, ask your instructor uh, about this before proceeding. Make sure that uh, you understand what you're doing. Um, that makes it a little bit challenging for the instructors because if everyone hits that checkpoint at the same time, like, ah, I can't answer all these at the same time. Sometimes we have to do a full class uh, discussion to answer the question for everybody. Um, sometimes we use um, student conversations. Um, these two students are uh, discussing the answers to this question. Who do you agree with? Uh, wh which student is right? Um, explain your reasoning. Um, so when we get to... Uh, a topic that we know is conceptually difficult for students. Sometimes we use that student conversation technique to, to really kind of tease out some of those common misconceptions that we know students encounter. Any other thoughts, insights, questions? What'd you think? You like it? Okay, mm -hmm. not so much. I really like yeah. the dinosaur oh, yeah, question at yeah. the end. I liked it, yeah. That's Colin Wallace. He loves dinosaurs. <laughs> I I also was drawn to the dinosaur question. <laughs> and in our fluids uh, section, um, for there's our water displacement um, part, and uh, we have some model dinosaurs that uh, get dunked in a tank, um, and we have to figure out the density of the dinosaur and. Uh, that, that was Colin's influence. So that last question was kind of like a transition to a different lab, right? With the stress and strain, because there is information that, that you don't need for this lab, right? The area, right. section area. Yeah, so that's a, one little bit of warning is if, uh, if you do adapt any of these for your own classes, um, there are sometimes references to a previous studio mm. 
or sometimes information uh, will be carried over uh, to another studio. So like um, we do a, a studio on stress and strain, uh, students stretch rubber bands and look at the, the amount of extension. And then when that rubber band is no longer stretched, it doesn't go back to its original length. Um, so the rubber band does not behave like a, a metal spring does. And so then we use that same data later for a resilience studio to actually look at the work done on stretching versus the work done on unstretching. And the ratio between those gives us the resilience, basically the efficiency of the, the elastic material. So some of these things tie together, um, but with some adaptation, you should be able to use each of them on their own, but just be careful because you may realize, wait, my students didn't do this thing before and I need to, to change some wording here because otherwise they're gonna be confused. Like, what? We don't have this data. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Well, something I'm curious about is, do you, do you see being able to use this kind of activity in your class to teach impulse and momentum? And if so, how might you use or what adaptations you might need? I actually shared some results within my group. I actually do something like this. I have a, a card, uh, a card, sorry, a card hitting the motion sensor that comes from vernier and you can change the rigid hook with a rubber bumper and the measure the force versus time and you can see a clear difference for the collision with the hook uh, with respect to the rubber bumper you should just try to get the same impulse both times it takes a few trials but the difference the balance between force and time is obvious Yeah, I can I could see um so I'm I'm teaching uh they're they're like first year physics students, not really so good with like Excel or the the graphing part. I can see like an adaptation I would have to do for my students. Like the activity is great, but I might have to add a little bit more help with some of the Excel graphing part, just because even if we've done something similar in a previous lab that was a previous lab so it means it's gone from their memory and so that that's just one thing it kind of struck out stuck out to me that like the activity is great but just there might need to be a, for my my students a little bit more um instruction i think with some of the excel part the graphing part and our students struggle with that too um you know at this point um for this studio students would have uh, already gone through three or four other studios using excel so at least some of the students at the table would uh, feel pretty comfortable, but not everyone. And so we encourage them to, to help each other if they get stuck. Um, and ideally, you put the, the student who feels least comfortable in front of the computer using Excel, and then the others who feel more comfortable can coach that student, but it doesn't usually work out that way. <laughs> I know one thing I try and do with a lot of our labs is like say, okay, now think about how this comes up in your everyday life. And that's partly why I like the dinosaur extension. Like this is a real thing. Um, but, you know, cause I was looking at it and thinking like this could apply to gymnastics. This could apply to here in Minnesota, we do hockey versus football since, you know, the Vikings are so good. Um, so like impacts on the board and things like that. So there are a lot of ways you could kind of think about how does that come up in the real world, which for my students tends to be what will help them remember it later on. I think that's important. We try to make our exam questions, um, maybe not all of them, but uh, each of our exams usually have uh, typically six questions for a 50 minute exam. And on average, uh, two of those are biologically relevant questions. So even on the exams, uh, we would try to have questions that are relevant to the, the discipline that the vast majority of students are, are focused on. We have a few students taking these courses who are not life science majors, but the courses are advertised as for the life science majors. And, uh, you know, at, at least 
many of the examples involve humans and humans tend to care, care about those type of questions. I wanted to ask, but you said earlier that you don't do lab reports, and I'm sure you said this before. So these lab activities are one course, or is it a lecture and a lab course? Do they have a lab course separately? No. So it's, it's part uh, of the same. That's right. Four credit hours uh, for yeah. each of these courses. Yeah. The oh, and, and that is different than what they are used to coming from a, a chemistry or a biology class. So those intro courses have separate lab components. And so some of them get a little bit, yeah, there's a little bit of dissonance and, uh, you know, we hit the ground running uh, with the, the first module on the first day of classes and the students are like, we have to come to lab? Yes, it's part of the course. In the first week, yes, it's part of the course. So these are the hands-on activities, part of the same course. That's right. Once in a while for different topics, you do That's something right. like this. Um, so I, we, we can't do hands-on activities here together um, in this space, but uh, just for, for some examples, um, well, I, I mentioned about the stretching rubber bands. So we use um, like a, a Pasco or a Vernier uh, cart track. Um, with a, a screw that uh, holds a string tied to a rubber band um, that goes over a pulley. And then you add some different weights to um, extend that rubber band with different forces and then plot the force versus extension of the rubber band under loading and then unloading. So that would be an example of a, or the stress strain studio of a hands-on activity. Uh, so that laboratory piece takes maybe 15 or 20 minutes, and that would be embedded within this two hour studio. Uh, does UNC not have like lab course requirements for students? I know places that I've uh, taught and been like you were required to do like some science labby thing yeah. as part of your curriculum. That is not how UNC is. No, that is. Uh, so um, all students used to be required. Uh, we just changed our general education requirements uh, this year. So it used to be two science classes with a lab, and now it's just one science class with the lab is the, the requirement for all UNC students. But uh, the students taking these courses are required to take it because of their major. Yeah. Because they're, you know, most of them are pre-med majors. And so, uh, well, not pre-med majors, biology majors hoping to get into to medical school or a pharmacy or dental school or something like that um and they still get the lab they, the, they still get the lab credit for the lab this course thing. right so they get that lab credit as part of this course even though it's not a separate lab component okay. so the studios from the registrar's office uh, they're labeled labs right. and we just uh, say well the registrar's office doesn't know what studio is so what the registrar's office calls the lab, we call a studio. They also call the art studios labs as well. Why they can't get the word studio in there, I don't know. I keep pushing for it, but it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened over the past 20 years. I don't know that it's going to happen anytime soon. Here in North Carolina, the structure of, <clears throat> of the lab versus lecture uh, situation was was dictated to the community college system back in 1997 when we switched from quarters with 58 different quarter systems in the state to a common course library across the state. Some courses, the UNC system said, well, we want you to, you, you can include the lab with that. Other courses like the the, chem, the physics had to have three sec, uh, three hours of lab and three hours of lecture, and they had to be listed separately. And students would typically have to sign up for those uh, separately if that's what the 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 uh, course library called for. But I always blurred that line, even if students had to like for our Hewitt course. To, I think they had to explicitly sign up for the lab. But I told the students we're going to teach this in an integrated format, and the, one of the good things about where I worked is that uh, nobody cared what I did, basically. Uh, that was also one of the bad things about where I worked. But, uh, you know, 
a lot of times in two-year schools, we face these odd constrictions from external influences. But I, I got around that just by telling students, even though you had to sign up for these two things separately, we're going to integrate them and we're going to blur that line because I don't, there's never going to be a day when I'm going to say, okay, lecture ends and lab will now begin. Every day is subject to this same integrated behavior. The students loved it. Administrators didn't know the difference and it worked out fine. Yay. Yeah, I, I would say the same thing. I taught in Maryland and that's how things were. The students signed up for lab and lecture differently or as two separate courses, but they were often tied. They didn't have to be. I just made sure that in our schedules, mine were always tied and then we just did whatever. It was appropriate, but I feel like this kind of studio format, I mean, that's how science is done, right? You don't sit there and think about something for some set amount of time and then you go and try it out in a lab for some set amount of time. <laughs> like. You, you go back and forth, like, well, let me tweak something. Let me go think about it. Let me learn some more. Let me now go back and try it again. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's, it's important to get students comfortable with that. I mean, that's how science really works. <laughs> yeah. Are ready to take a look at another studio? So I think we'll do the Thin Films studio next. So if you go back to the list on Sakai, uh, scroll down to the e &M section, uh, Wave Optics, look for the studio called Thin Films. I forget which number it is, um, but uh, you'll recognize it because when you pull it up, it has a blue morpho butterfly, really beautiful iridescent butterfly. And this is uh, the first part of the studio is why do those colors look so brilliant? And why are they blue? We seem to have lost a participant. Is everybody okay with the same rooms? Did that arrangement work out before? Because now it's going to be three and two. Is 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 that okay? I think we lost Max. We did. I I can join uh, room two and play okay. with rooms. Okay. All right. So I'll open the uh, the rooms again. through all the um, all the way through but I didn't expect you to but uh, hopefully you at least get a sense of what they feel like and now you have access to um, 54 of these <laughs> and so you can take as much time as you want uh, looking through um, and again uh, we keep the, the studio uh, the same from semester to semester um, we sometimes make little tweaks or sometimes we'll give some students some uh, extra guidance or suggestions um, so you can feel to feel free to do the same and make adaptations as you desire for your students. And Joe just put in the chat a uh, link to the the paper that we wrote for uh, AJP um, about this uh, transformation to the this lecture studio format and uh, the panels. So you can take a look at that if you are interested. And again, the PowerPoint slides that I was using um, are in the workshop folder on that Sakai PAL site. So I want to bring everybody back together here, see if you have any other thoughts or questions. Uh, I had a quick question. Um, during the lecture parts, of course, is there uh, the similar like heavy emphasis on biology applications uh, for the examples and stuff the students work through and or to think about during lecture? Sometimes, not as much. So those the biological applications tend to be most prevalent in the studios and on the exams. Um, not as much on the homework because we're more or less reliant on the, the problems that are in the, the homework system, whether it's a master in physics or expert TA. Uh, we try to put in some of our own questions and problems, but uh, uh, there aren't a lot. Uh, so mostly the biological applications in the studio and the exams. The, the lecture is really just hitting the fundamentals of uh, the main ideas, equations that are needed, uh, some conceptual questions, uh, clear questions to make sure students have a good foundational understanding before 
they dive into the studios. And not a lot of problem solving in the lectures either. And students sometimes get frustrated about that. They, they'd like to see more problems. So we do that in the Friday Q&A sessions, but not everyone attends those. So then students are like, I, I'd like to see more problem solving. Well, you should come to the Q&A session. Oh, yes, I probably should. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? I think that there's uh, an evaluation. Oh, there we go. Joe just sent out the link for the, the workshop evaluation. And I have an, uh, uh, the obligatory QR code that I can put up on the screen if anybody particularly demands that format, I can do it. <laughs> and just to reiterate, please do the evaluations. It helps us uh, convince NSF that uh, we are worth continuing to be funded <laughs> as well as uh, helps us gauge interest in how to plan and provides our facilitators with uh, feedback as well. But I wanna thank you all for taking a huge chunk of your Saturday to come and join us today. Thank you for appreciate the, everybody taking time to go through it with us, it's great. This was a lot of fun. I'm curious, uh, how many of you have participated in other optics workshops? No, maybe first time for some of you. I'm not, I can't remember for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you you facilitated one, Rod, so I think that- I guess be. I did, yeah, you're right. I Make, that counts. Okay. okay, yeah. 